Have you heard the exciting reports of millions making decisions for Christ? Of the church exploding and increasing in number? Well, we want to tell you about a secret. It's called the fallaway rate. 80 to 90% of those who are making decisions for Christ are now falling away from the faith. That means that modern evangelism and the methods it uses to bring people into the church is producing 80 to 90 of what we commonly call backsliders for every 100 decisions for Christ. Let me make it more real for you. A number of years ago, a major denomination in the U.S. was able to obtain 294,000 decisions for Christ. 294,000! Unfortunately, they could only find 14,000 in fellowship, which means they couldn't account for 280,000 of their decisions. And this is normal, modern evangelistic results from local churches right up to large crusades. And we believe this tragedy is happening, not because of a lack of follow-up, but rather because the church has strayed away from the biblical way of presenting the gospel, the way Jesus did. So let's look now at how Jesus' approach was radically different from the typical modern methods. In Mark 10, verse 17, we have the story of the rich young man who runs up to Jesus and says, Good Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, I don't know about you, but if that happened to me, I would be very excited. Mm -hmm. That would be a chance of a lifetime. Notice that Jesus does not say, Oh, my friend, you have a God-shaped hole in your heart that only I can fill. And if you will say this prayer and ask me into your heart, you'll get love, joy, peace, and go to heaven when you die. No, Jesus started by saying, Why do you call me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. So he was correcting this man's understanding of the word good. And then he pointed him to the Ten Commandments. He gave him five of them. He said, you know the law. He says, you shall not lie. You shall not steal. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder and honor your father and mother. And the young man said, I've kept all those since my youth. And then Jesus pointed him to the essence of the first and second commandment and said, there's one thing you still lack. Go and sell all your goods, give to the poor, and then you'll have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. And the Bible says that the man went away, sad. And I'm thinking to myself, didn't Jesus know that no one can keep the Ten Commandments? We're not saved by keeping the law, we're saved by grace. Why did he talk to him that way? I mean, he didn't talk about God's love, God's grace, he didn't pray with him. He didn't even say something like, wait, come back, would you like to come to my house this weekend for a lamb barbecue where I could establish a no-strings-attached, non-confrontational relationship with you? It seemed to me Jesus might have benefited from a friendship evangelism course. But that was my shallow and immature understanding of what he was doing. He was using a principle that prepares the heart for grace. It's a principle that has been used by Charles Spurgeon, John Wesley, George Whitfield, And it, it converts the soul according to the Bible. It shows a person why they need the Savior. It's a key that changes everything. And that's why the enemy does not want you to get a hold of it. It's something that the enemy has bent out of shape over the years. He's misused it and even hidden it so that much of the church does not even know that it exists. That's why we call it hell's best kept secret. So please watch and listen carefully and don't let anything distract you. Seek and save the lost the way Jesus did. There's only a certain amount of time left. Time left. Time left. So use the law and use your testament to reach out to the lost. Reach out to the lost. There's nothing more important in your eternal salvation. The Bible tells us in Psalm 19, verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. What is it that the Bible says is perfect and actually converts the soul? Why, well, Scripture makes it very clear. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. That'll illustrate the function of God's law. Let's just look for a few moments 
It's civil law. Imagine if I said to you, I've got some good news for you. Someone has just paid a $25,000 speeding fine on your behalf. You'd probably look at me and say, that's not good news. It doesn't make sense. I don't have a $25,000 speeding fine. You see, my good news would probably not be good news. It would sound foolish. But more than that, it would also sound offensive because I'm implying that you've broken the law when you don't think you have. But if I said it to you this way, it might make more sense. On the way here today, the law clocked you at going 55 miles an hour through an area set aside for a blind children's convention. There were 10 clear warning signs stating that 15 miles an hour was the maximum speed, but you went straight through at 55 miles an hour. What you did was extremely dangerous. The law was about to take its course when someone you don't even know stepped in and paid the fine for you. You are very fortunate. Can you see that telling you precisely what you've done wrong first actually makes the good news make sense? If I don't bring clear instruction you've violated the law, the good news will seem foolishness, it will seem offensive. But once you understand you've broken that law, then that good news becomes good news indeed. In the same way, if I approach a hardened sinner, someone whose understanding is darkened, and say, Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, it'll be foolishness to him and offensive to him. Foolishness because it won't make sense. The Bible actually says that. The preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that are perishing. And offensive because I'm insinuating he's a sinner when he doesn't think he is. As far as he's concerned, there are plenty of people far worse than him. But if I take the time to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, it may make more sense. If I take the time to open up the divine law and to show the sinner precisely what he's done wrong, that he's offended God by transgressing his law, then when he becomes, as James says, convinced of the law as a transgressor, the good news of the fine being paid for him will not be foolishness, it will not be offensive, it will be the power of God unto salvation. Now with that thought in mind, let's look at Romans 3.19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. So there's one function of God's law. It's to stop the mouth of the sinner. To stop a, a person from justifying himself, saying, ah, there's plenty of people far worse than I am, I'm not a bad person. No, the law stops the mouth of justification and leaves the whole world, not just the Jews, but the whole world, guilty before God. Romans 3.20 Wherefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So there, the law tells us what sin is. In fact, 1 John 3, 4 says, sin is transgression of the law. And then in Romans 7, verse 7, Paul says, I had not known sin, but by the law. Paul said he didn't know what sin was until the law told him. And Galatians 3, 24, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. So there he's saying that the law is like a schoolmaster that leads us to Jesus Christ so that we can be justified through faith in his blood. The law doesn't help us, it just leaves us helpless. The law doesn't justify us, it just leaves us guilty before a just and holy God. Let me say that again, this is so important. We are not saved by the law. We are saved by God's grace through faith. The law just shows us we're filthy dirty and in desperate need of God's cleansing. 